Hello and welcome everyone to our uh, cabling webinar. I have with me uh, the rig guy himself, Stephen Tulitsky. Uh, he's going to be talking in a second here, but I am not Stephen Tulitsky. I know absolutely nothing about uh, cabling trees. So uh, I'm Kale Royer. I am with Tree Stuff. I'm the man behind the curtain uh, making things happen uh, most of the time. And I would like to tell you first about a couple upcoming events that we have. So uh, the first thing that we've got coming up is that right now uh, we have a promotion for 20% off all Teufel Burger, Teufel Burger products uh, using the code TEUF20. That's T-E-U-F-2-0. That will get you 20% off everything, all the climbing stuff uh, from Teufel Burger. And that is including the Tree Motion, uh, the Tree Motion uh, Pro and the, uh, not pro, whatever the other one is, the essentials, uh, which is like $200 off, some, something crazy like that. So go check that out. Uh, if you're looking to get some more climbing gear, that's a great deal. Does not happen all the time. Um, and there are no exclusions on that. The other thing that I wanna talk about is a little thing called Treetopia that is happening uh, starting, I believe in seven days exactly, August 4th through 6th uh, is a massive tree festival slash expo slash uh, training extravaganza that we're having out in Vallejo, California on Mare Island at Alden Park and pretty much take over the entire park. Um, vendors come out and it's an expo area that way, all outdoors. We have the famous games that uh, Tree Stuff is kind of known for uh, that we're putting on. We've got the a uh, giant ninja ladder that you can climb. You can win prizes depending on how well you do. Uh, there's the human claw. We have something like fifty or sixty thousand dollars worth of prizes uh, stuffed into boxes, and you can go grab them uh, and take them home with you. But you have to play the game, and it's kind of hard. It's a lot of fun. It's a blast. If you've been anywhere we are uh, that we've had the the human claw, you know. Uh, we also have a bunch of other games that are you don't you haven't seen before because they're brand new and we haven't set them up yet, but uh, a lot of fun. Like the bear hug uh, is going to be really cool. It's going to be interesting to see how that's set up, but uh, there's also a head to head climbing competition that we'll be having for these three days. But the big draw, the main thing is the training. We have over 35 classes. Uh, almost all of them are uh, CEUs, uh, can offer CEUs to do one and a half uh, or one CEU, depending on how long it is. Um, we have things like the Certified Arborist Crash, certified arborist crash Course uh, with Lindsey Purcell. That's three hours of his like preparation to get you started on your way to becoming a Certified Arborist. Uh, there's uh, things uh, Cyrus from A Plus Tree Care, who we are doing Treetopia with, is going to be doing a little talk on how he leads his business, which is one of the fastest growing tree businesses in the United States, uh, definitely on the West Coast. So uh, there's that. There's cabling demonstrations. There's rigging demonstrations. There's uh, how to climb. There's how to do tree inspections. There's a whole bunch of uh, talking about PHC, uh, plant health care. There's, um, I believe Marget is doing a, their own certification kind of class as part of theirs. So you walk away with a Marget certified uh, applicator's license. Uh, it's, it's almost overwhelming how many classes we have. Uh, it is free for kids under 12 to come out and do. Everything is family friendly, uh, except maybe some of the professional classes. Don't make them go to those classes. They're like an hour and a half long about plant health care. That's just mean making them sit through that. There's kids zones where they can go climb and everything while you do while you do your classes. So um, check that out, treetopiausa.com. Uh, it is awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. That's the 4th through the 6th, Vallejo, California. It is worth it, uh, especially if you are a certified arborist. You can get all of your CEUs that you need there um, and the best training from the best people in the world. Uh, that is pretty much my pitch. Uh, just make sure you do that. At the end of this webinar is the other thing I want to talk about. Uh, there will be a link to a quiz posted in the comments. So I will post it. I will pin it. You click on that link and it will take you to a little Google Forms quiz. Uh, 
If you get 16 out of 20 on that quiz, then you will get your CEU. So if you're watching this right now, that means if you're watching this live, that is, then you can get two CEUs for watching this webinar, uh, asking questions and taking the quiz at the end. If you're watching it in the future, so it's pre-recorded, uh, then it's going to be worth one CEU. There's a little bit of grace period there. So like if you need to go to the bathroom and you miss something, uh, you can you can come out and you can watch that back later and do it. So uh, keep an eye out for that if you're looking for your CEUs. The other thing is Stephen has a whole bunch of knowledge. He's done cabling and arborist work for a very long time. So post any questions that you have in the comments section uh, and I'll ask him, we'll talk about it and, uh, and, and we'll get you learned up and, and going out there and expanding your services into cabling or just getting better at cabling uh, and uh, what you do. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the man himself. Uh, and uh, Stephen, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how Rig Guy uh, came to be. Thanks, Kale. I appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to talk to some of you guys about cabling. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been uh, in the tree service business uh, a couple of times. I've started two two tree companies. They're both op still operating. I'm not involved with them anymore. I sold both of them. But uh, uh, I'm a certified arborist and started back in probably 1972 or three. So I've been doing this for, you know, a pretty long time. And uh, the, the reason that uh, I got involved with the, the wire stop is that uh, I had a tree that was a co-dominant stem and they, they went up pretty high uh, together. You couldn't, there just wasn't enough room to put uh, a regular uh, cabling system in between them. And so I came up with this idea of uh, doing it from the outside rather than from the inside. And it, it kind of developed from there. But uh, uh, I have been uh, selling wire stops now for pretty close to 15 years. And uh, they're patent pending uh, and have a trademark on the name and have about four or five other patents. And I have a couple of little products that I'm gonna try to get out hopefully in the near future. But I enjoy working with trees and uh, I, I really enjoy cabling. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot to it sometimes and uh, sometimes it's pretty easy, but I hope to be able to present it to y'all in such a way that it could be a benefit to your business but not only a benefit to you, but also a benefit uh, to your clients. So uh, let me give you just a, a real brief history of, of cabling. I, I think cabling got started back maybe in the early 1900s with, uh, with bulldog clips and, uh, or U-bolts where you just wrap the wire around a, a lag hook or a through bolt. And then you, you put about three of these clips together to hold the, hold the wire on and uh, th that looked not really professional, but I think it did the job. And, I, and the next thing was, uh, was the hand, uh, hand splices. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever done hand splices, but uh, actually a hand splice is a really nice way of doing a cable. It, it's, uh, I think it's very, very attractive and finished looking if it's done properly but you have to do hand splices with malleable cable and, uh, or common grade cable. And common grade cable is uh, just a lot, uh, it doesn't have nearly the strength as EHS does. And it's, it's I'd say uh, a half or even less than that as strong as uh, EHS cable. And so uh, you, don't, you don't get nearly the holding power from it. Uh, but, and then the, the hand splice, is, it's not an easy thing to do. You kind of have to know how to do it, but it also takes a while to do it. So uh, it's, it's not something that uh, most people want to do because it's, it's just kind of hard to, to make it happen. But it does make a nice, a nice cable if it's done properly. Uh, I, I guess the, the thing that's been most prominent over the last 
oh, 20, 25 years or more is the preform wraps. And uh, the preform wraps do a good job. They're actually a, uh, uh, come from the power pole industry and uh, they're, they're uh, from guy wires to hold up power poles. And they, they work uh, pretty well. They do a pretty good job as long as they're installed properly and as, as long as you have a, uh, a heavy duty thimble. If you don't have a heavy duty thimble, they'll tend to pinch down and break. But, uh, but other than that, they do a pretty good job, but they, they can be difficult to install. And also uh, they, they're, they have a lot of parts to them. There's about five parts that you have to have to, to make them work. And so it's easy not to have the right part. And they're, they're also installed with either a lag hook or a through bolt. And uh, that, that can be problematic. So anyway, the, the wire stop uh, uh, it kind of solves some of those problems because with a wire stop, instead of having to put a, uh, a large hole in the tree for a lag hook or for a through bolt, you drill through the tree with, uh, with a drill that's a 16th of an inch over the size of cable that you're using. So if you're uh, going to install a quarter inch cable, you just use a 5 16th inch drill bit, which is uh, pretty small. And it's pretty easy to drill that much and it doesn't harm the tree very much. So it has some big advantages over you know, a three quarter inch drill or something that size that you might have to use for a through bolt. Uh, and then uh, uh, preformed after I came out with uh, with the wire stop, they came out with a wedge grip. They actually came and talked to me at a trade show about maybe working together on it, but they decided to do their own thing. And the wedge grip is, uh, it's it's a nice device. You, you don't have any parts to lose. It, it comes as one part. Uh, probably the uh, the downside of the wedge grip is uh, well, a couple. One is that it's a good bit larger, and so the larger it is, uh, the bigger a place or a deformity it's going to make in the tree when the tree grows over it. So that's not a good thing. And then they also seem to fail with uh, dynamic loading. That is, if you if the say if the wind's blowing and uh, the, the the leads come apart and then they come back together and come apart again and they kind of snap uh it, it'll pull through sometimes on a on a wedge grip so though it, it has its uh downsides i guess and of course i'm I, i'm the inventor and the seller of the uh wire stop so if it seems like i'm pretty biased uh i am i, I really have a uh <laughs> a biased point of view on it and I think they do a good job and, and the people that I've talked to that are using them seem to be real happy with them. And so uh, uh, I, I think they can really help, again, arborists be more successful with what they're doing, but also that they give the client a, a good fix for their tree. And it also uh, looks better than any other system. Uh, most of the time uh, when I install a, a wire stop, if it's any distance in the tree at all, the people come out and they go, well, where's it at? And uh, because they, they really can't even see it unless you point it out to them. And even then sometimes it's hard for them to see it. So it makes a nice finished professional uh, job when you're, when, when you're done with it. Uh, there, there are several reasons why arborists don't cable. I, when I do trade shows, you know, I'll have people come up to me and they'll say, well, you know, we, we just, we just don't cable. And, uh, and, you know, I'll ask them, well, why don't you cable? Uh, because it's a good service for your customer. It's, it's a, you know, a, a profitable thing uh, for you. And, and they said, well, it's just too complicated. There, there's too many parts to keep up with. There's, and it, it's not profitable for us uh, because, by the time we get everything done, uh, you get, uh, uh, say we don't have one of the parts we need and we have to stop and go get it or whatever else. It, it's just, it's not worth doing. Uh, and, and then the other major complaint is that uh, uh, the, the liability issues. There are people that say, well, 
if I put a cable in a tree, that's, that's basically saying that uh, there's something wrong with the tree. And so if something happens, well, I'm, I'll be liable for it or I'm potentially liable for it. And uh, let, let me address both of those issues. Uh, I think that uh, uh, cabling can be a very profitable thing for a tree service. Now, if you're gonna just go out and cable, put one cable in one tree, uh, you know, you're gonna have to charge enough that that, it, that might not be feasible all the time. And that's that's not the best way. But but say, for instance, you're up in the tree and you are trimming the tree anyway. Well, now to put a cable in the tree while you're already in it, uh, it probably takes me maybe two minutes an end to put a cable in. So I could put a cable in a tree if I was already in the tree cabling it and maybe, you know, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. It, of course, now I've been doing it a while. So if you get started, it's going to take you a little longer. But, but it really shouldn't take very long at all once you get your uh, system down on exactly how you're going to do it. Uh, and so if you're, if you're up in the tree to begin with, then it, it really is a profit source because you can charge you know, $250, $300 to put one cable in a tree. And, uh, and again, if you're already there, already trimming it, then that's just in addition to what you're, what you're doing. And of course, uh, again, I'm not talking about just making money. I'm talking about helping people because there are people that have dangerous situations that they're not aware of. And, uh, and then the, the, the liability issue is somewhat of a, uh, somewhat of a non-issue as far as I'm concerned, because a lot of the cabling that I do, it's not necessarily for deformed trees or, or trees that have anything wrong with them. They're just trees that have, uh, they have big limbs or they have, let's say they're a bifurcated trunk or there's, there's something that, that could be improved by having some support. And, uh, the, the tree is not, it's not damaged or it's not about to fail or anything like that necessarily, but this is just insurance, if you will, to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if you do, uh, if you do happen to uh, cable a tree that uh, has problems, like I cabled a big red oak tree one time that had a cavity in it, and I, I really advised the people to take the tree out, but it was Oh, about a six or seven foot diameter tree at the base and just well, was a huge, beautiful tree. And it was the only tree in their backyard and they wanted to save it. And I said, well, I can cable it for you, but at the same time, this tree is going to fail. And I don't know, I don't know when, but it's not going to stay apart forever. I mean, it's not, not going to stay together forever. And, and it, it stayed together for about three or four years before it, uh, uh, pulled apart, but it did pull apart a leader. And, uh, but the wire stop held the, the, uh, the leader uh, horizontally up in the tree and it didn't damage anything. And then of course they, they did have to go ahead and remove it at that point. But, but you just have to have a clear understanding and, and it's really best probably to have it in writing if you're gonna cable a tree that you think could be uh, dangerous uh, potentially that, that you're doing it and they're taking the responsibility, not you. You're giving them, you know, the information and letting them make the decision. And of course they take responsibility for their decision. Uh, uh, the, the, the other thing about cabling, one of the reasons that, that people don't cable uh, is they'll tell me, they say, well, you know, people just don't ask me to cable a trip. That, you know, I just don't ever get any requests for it. And I'll go, well, uh, yeah, I, I understand that because, you know, a lot of homeowners don't know what a cable is. I mean, I, I talk to people all the time about what I do. And I, you know, I sell wire stops of cable trees and they go, well, what, what's a cable? I mean, what, why do you put a cable in a tree? And, and so the, the homeowners generally are, are ignorant of what a cable is and what it can do for them. So if you don't bring it up, if your salespeople don't bring it up, uh, they're not going to bring it up. So if you're not doing any cabling, the, the 
uh, reason that you're not doing any cabling likely is that you're not selling cable. And so it's, it is something that you have to sell, but it's not hard to sell. And if, again, you're already there, you're already doing tree work, then it's, it's an addition to what you're, what you're already doing. It just adds some more to it. Let me, let me give you some examples. Uh, Kale, now, can I, can they see this tree that's on my monitor now? Okay, that, that was the red oak that I was talking to you about earlier. And this, this uh, uh, piece here is actually hanging horizontally from the main stem and it did break off, but, the, but you can see the, the cable and the wire stop actually held it up in the tree horizontally. And so we were able to remove it and there was no damage anywhere. So uh, even though it, it, it did turn loose, uh, again, it, it did keep any damage from happening to the home or, or anybody else. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up some different pictures now. Uh, uh, before we get that, I actually, have a question for you. Okay. Let me make sure they sure. can hear you. So um, I've got a question here. Uh, the liability part seems to really stick with people. Um, so right. Kirk Miller's asking if you've ever put a turn cable in and uh, in a tree and had it fail after. Um, and we also have Alyssa on YouTube is asking if uh, how many liability cases you've seen uh, brought to trial or um, become a problem with people? Yeah, you know, I actually don't know of any, and I've never been involved with any. I've never had any kind of liability issues from any of the cabling that I've done, and I, I don't, I don't really have any idea how many cables I've installed, but I know it's in the thousands. And uh, so, and, and of course, when I'm talking to people, I mean, I'll tell them putting this cable in the tree is not a guarantee that the tree can't fail. Nobody can guarantee that the tree can't fail. You know, a tornado could come through here, a hurricane can come through here. Uh, you, you can have, you know, even severe thunderstorms that can rip trees up regardless of whether they have cables in them or not. So. The cable is, is not a guarantee that none of these things can happen, but it, it does give you a, a certain amount of safety that you didn't have if the cable was not in the tree. And so I tried to explain to them, you know, on the front end, uh, what their expect expectation should be so that, you know, if something were to happen, they're not going to come back to me and say, well, you said this thing was going to, you know, keep my tree from failing because I, you know, I, I don't ever say that to somebody because I don't, I don't know what's going to happen to the tree. I know what their best opportunity of keeping it healthy is. I don't, I don't know that a storm might not take that opportunity away and, and damage the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not, it's not all on you on that. How do you, how often have you found cables that cabling fail? Just My on their own. Hmm? My cabling or somebody else's? Um, well, let's, let's go with both. Okay. Uh, my cabling, I, I don't, I don't know that I've ever had a case that it's failed. Nah, I take it back. There was one case when it failed, but it, it failed because I installed one of the ends improperly and it failed while I was there and I was able to reinstall it properly. And so I didn't have a problem. Uh, but as far as me installing one and then there'd be a failure after that, I, I do think there was a time that, that happened. I was working with another guy and I, I don't know if he put it in or I put it in, but anyway, it was put in improperly. And it did fail and it didn't, I mean, the tree didn't fail, but the, the cable failed and I went back and reinstalled it and, and didn't have any trouble since then. So uh, it has happened, but again, we're talking about thousands of cables that mm -hmm. I put in. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not, 
it's it's not likely and it in the whole time i've been selling wire stops i i have never had a time where a wire stop itself has failed uh the the only time that there's been failures if it was if, if it's been installed improperly and usually they'll hold up even if they're installed improperly unless the system loosens and then tightens back again and loosens and then it'll fail. So, uh, you know, installing it properly is is important. And, and I can tell if it's installed properly or not because the, the outside block is aluminum and the, the inside taper is stainless steel. And uh, so it's done that way because when when there's really high pressures on the system, the the uh, EHS, the high strength cable, will actually uh, move into the aluminum a little bit, and so it it holds better having the aluminum block than it would a, a steel outside block, which would tend to crush the cables rather than cushion them a little bit. But that also makes like a rifling on that uh, inside uh, on the block and not on the inside of the block. And so by that rifling, it's pretty easy to tell whether the whether the uh, wire stop was installed properly or not, because it should be installed in such a way where uh, all of the cables or all of the strands of wire in the cable are evenly spaced and the the taper itself never touches the outside block it's suspended by the by the uh cables or the pieces of the pieces of wire of the cable gotcha um i'm gonna pull up a, a picture here uh, while we we start talking um i would do you want to go into your pictures and because i'm interested in hearing from you about um when uh, you would suggest uh, to use cabling to a customer. Yeah, let, let me pull up a couple of these pictures and, and let me give you a little background on them. I, right. you know, we, we had talked yesterday and so I went out uh, and uh, I took these pictures. I, I went, I guess, maybe a half a mile from my house just kind of just drove around a little bit and took these pictures now there were also some really some better uh pictures that i that, that i could have taken but i would have had to have gotten in the people's yards and i really didn't feel comfortable doing that so i didn't take pictures of anything that i couldn't take a picture from from the car but uh i think i have here about I don't know, 10 or 12 pictures, and I probably could have taken 20. So that's just to give you a little bit of an idea of how many trees there are that could be cabled just within a half a mile of my house. And when I say could be cabled, I'm not talking about trying to sell somebody something they don't need. I'm talking about selling people things that will help them. This first picture, uh, if you see this, this are, this is actually two different trees or two white oaks. Okay, just, just a second, let me move it. You're able to see it now? Okay. Hit, say that again. Hit the green. Okay. So, so this tree, it's it's actually not uh, one tree, it's two trees, and uh, both of them are white oaks. And you can see this kind of dominant tree on the right hand side has a fairly, you know, a fairly good top in it, uh, fairly symmetrical. But the left hand tree is not very symmetrical at all. It kind of leans to the left. And if it were to fall over, it's going to catch this this side of the house right here. Uh, I actually did install a cable in this tree. It has a five sixteenths inch cable right here. You, I don't think that you can see it, but that cable limits this other tree's ability to move in that direction. 
Now, the tree can still move. I mean, it, it can go back and forth and sideways and whatever else, but, but, it, but it limits how far it can go towards the house. So uh, let me see how I can get another picture up here. How do I get this off a of full screen, Kale? Kale, how did I get a different picture up here? Uh, yeah, well, Max escape doesn't make it escape. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now, can you see that okay with that, it being full screen, or would it be better if I full screened it? Okay. Now, this, you can see the house here, and then here's a, a split tree. And again, you can see how all the weight on the, on the right side of this tree is going right over the house. And in, you know, in bifurcated trees, uh, it's not uncommon for pretty much all the weight to be going one direction on one of the stems and all the weight to be going the other direction on the other stem. And that's really not a, a, a stable situation for a tree. And so a cable right here could prevent this tree from falling on top of the house, which is where it's going to go if it falls, because it, you know, all the weight is, is, is going that way. So would you, would you say that this, uh, I, we couldn't tell from the pictures, could you, would you say that these are co-dominant stems where you might have an actual, like, where it would grow later in to, uh, having like that bark inclusion or is this a, a more of a proper structure? It's just not ideal. Yeah. You know, it, it varies. There's both. But, uh, and I wasn't able to see the bottom of that tree again because I didn't, you know, I didn't get out of my car to go look at it. And it was kind of behind the house. So, you know, I don't know, but I'm sure that happens, uh, you know, and, and it can get to be where a tree is hazardous. And, and, I, and I certainly don't recommend cabling hazardous trees. I think hazardous trees should be taken down and, uh, you know, a cable is good for some things. It's not good for everything. And so, uh, you know, when a tree gets to the point that it's causing a hazard to a, to a home or to a car or to a person, especially, then I think it needs to be removed. But I think, you know, a lot of these trees are not at that situation yet. And uh, so they, they, there are certainly potentials for cables. You know, this picture is of a multi-stem tree and you can just see how many splits there are down in here and it would be it would be a good candidate for say a three-way cable or maybe even a four-way cable where you come up in here and you you tie all these uh trunk trunks or stems together with a cable and that keeps it from splitting down in here All right, now on this tree, you can kind of see as you go up the trunk, how you have your crotch here, your main stem here, but then this fairly substantial limb is going up over the house. Now, I don't, I don't think there, there's anything wrong with the tree as best I can tell. I don't know that there's included bark or there, I don't see any black, uh, you know, coming down like there's something wrong with mm -hmm. the crotch. But at the same time, you know, with a cable right here, you, it just assures the homeowner that this piece is not going to split off and hit the top of their house. Uh, even if it splits off, again, the cable should hold it up in the tree so that, so that no damage occurs to the house. But like I said earlier, I, you know, it, it wouldn't be like I'd be saying to the people now, I'll just guarantee you that that tree can't 
you know, split off and it's not going to hurt your house. But this is the best opportunity if you want to keep it for that not to happen. Okay. Um, how so? How are you deciding where to place these cables when you're when you're talking about this? When you're when you're looking at a tree, how are you deciding where to place it? Well, you know that's addressed in the ANSI A three hundred standards. Uh, it's ANSI A three hundred part uh, three is where cabling is is talked about. And what it says is that from the crotch, in other words, from right here, you go two thirds the way up to the crown and that's where the cable should be installed. And of course, that's, that's kind of a rule of thumb. It's, uh, there, there are situations that might change that depending on how the tree is, <clears throat> the tree is structured and the size of the pieces and that kind of thing. But two thirds up from where the crotch is is what the ANSI standards call for. Gotcha. Two thirds from the crotch. From the crotch, yeah, not not from the base, but from the crotch right here, you go up hmm. about two thirds, and you know you certainly don't want to put it in wood that's too too weak to support the support the load, so you want to put it in fairly substantial wood, and and I don't like cabling. See how this piece kind of, this crotch more goes towards the inside of the tree. I would much rather put a cable in, in the piece that goes towards the outside of the tree that's leaning away from the inside rather than an inside because you can split this crotch here if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. Put too much pressure on it. This, this goes against this side, which is a much stronger piece. Uh, what types of of cabling options do you have? Yeah, th there's really a, a, a lot. I mean, I mean, me personally, uh, what I sell are the the 101 wire stops, which are for three eighths and five six five sixteenths EHS cable, and three eighths cable not many people use it because it's pretty stiff and it's a little bit hard to work with but it's like 15,500 pounds breaking strength something like that and that's a pretty stout cable that's actually the cable that was in that uh, big red oak that we saw several pictures ago that was hanging sideways that was a 3 8 inch cable and if you're if you're in something like that that you know, you're really concerned about it. It's, it might be worth going with three eighths. What I tend to use most often is five sixteenths. And the reason I use five sixteenths is because uh, five sixteenths EHS cable is about 15,000, 15,500 pounds breaking strength. So it's, it's you don't not losing all that much from a three eighths. Uh, but you're gaining a whole lot from a quarter because a quarter inch isn't but about 5,500 pounds breaking strength. So you're gaining a good bit from a, from a quarter inch. Uh, and it's not that much harder to work with. It's not that much more expensive. And so you're kind of getting, uh, uh, you know, more bang for your buck, more protection, if you will. And so I, I, tend, to, I tend to like the 5 sixteenths. Although it is overkill on a lot of things. Uh, a lot of the guys up in the Northeast tend to use quarter inch cable for everything, uh, real big stuff, which makes me a little bit nervous. But the thing about cables is that when you're, uh, you know, two thirds of the way up a tree, there's, it, it's hard to get that much pull on something because the, the, uh, the limbs say if they're like this, when the wind blows, that they're going to kind of move together one way or the other, uh, or they're going to go this way. But in any case, the cable kind of, kind of goes with it. So you don't have a real strong place to, for, for it to stop and pull against. So it's not like it's really hard to pull 5,000 pounds against something that's moving. So when I pull on one of those uh, leads on, on, in the tree, then that, that lead moves. 
So it's hard to put, you know, 5,500 pounds of pressure on a lead when it, when it can move back and forth. And so even though 5,500 pounds doesn't sound like a whole lot, it really is a pretty good bit. And, and I don't, I can't, I'm not sure that I've ever seen a cable break. Uh, you know, the, the, the tree will break, I think, before the cable will break. I, I just don't think I've ever seen a cable snap. It, they're, they're pretty tough. And, uh, and again, you just don't, it's not easy to get a real strong pull against them. So you have that give back and forth. So, uh, but again, five sixteenths is to me, it's just kind of, a uh, just gives you a little extra, uh, confidence that it's going to be there with whatever mm -hmm. fails in what you put in the tree. And I, that makes me feel good. I like, I like that sense of security. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can continue with your, uh, with your photos. Okay. If you'd like. Yes. Yeah. Let me get this one over there. And you can see here how these trees, uh, are, you know, bifurcated and, and at a very low place. Now these are, basically decorative trees that, you know, they're river birches and, uh, you know, a lot of them actually come from the nursery as, as they they have three splits in them. They don't, they come with three splits and, and they, they make them that way, which is all well and good for looks, but it's not so good for the tree as far as it uh, being there a long time. So, you know, around here, they'll live, uh, I don't know, 20 years or something like that before they start pulling apart. So, you know, anybody that I know that has river birches that are either bifurcated like this or they have, they have three trunks, I'll tell them, you know, if you want to keep them, you're going to have to cable them. Uh, and, they're, and they're not big enough to be particularly dangerous. And so we have, you know, we have small hardware too. I have like an ornamental wire stop that can be used with three sixteenths uh, EHS strand. It has a lot of strength, but it's really small. You, they're small enough that you can use them in dogwoods or, uh, Bradford pears, you know, anything that's, uh, you know, they're trees, but they're not, you know, they're not big trees. They're more like bush trees or something. And, uh, but, uh, they work very well in those and, and they're not unsightly because they're so small. Again, you can hardly even see them, but, uh, but, but if you want to keep these trees and the same thing with, with some of the pears, you know, the Bradford pears, they're, they're going to fall apart when they get to be about 15 or 20 years old, if there's something that's not done for them. And again, they don't usually get to be big enough where they're dangerous to people, but some of the people want to keep them. And they, and if they do, then of course I recommend, uh, pruning it, pruning them before you cable them so that you can take some of the weight off of them. So you have both the weight reduction and, and then the, uh, the extra strength of the cable as well. Um, I've got a quick question here from, okay. uh, Michael Oxman actually, who knows if he's He's up to some, but I'm pretty sure he knows this. Uh, what's the date the current ANSI tree support system standard was published? I want to you know, say. I don't know when the last, yeah, when the last one was published. Uh, but you can actually uh, pull it up online just by going, uh, just putting in ANSI A300 uh, and put in section three if you want to get the, you know, the cabling part of it. But when the last update was, uh, like you know, I don't, I, I didn't notice. I'm seeing 2013 is what it looks like. Um, yeah, but they, they keep that pretty up to date. Um, and that's one of the nice things about cabling is that uh, there hasn't really been any, any big changes in it, uh, recently. No, there really had. Uh, there mm -hmm. hadn't been that much happening in the last, you know, 10 years or so. I don't guess. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's it for questions right now. Sorry. Don't mean to distract you. No, not at all. And I, you know, any questions are fine. You don't want to distract me a bit. I, I, 
I enjoy, uh, you know, the question. So that that's no problem. Uh, this next picture is it's a white oak as well. And you can see the potential problem there. Uh, you know, <laughs> that would not be a hard sell, I don't think. Uh, you know, if you went to that yard and, and kind of showed the person what the situation was and you showed them that, you know, pretty much all the weight on this, this lead is going to be going over the house and all the weight on this lead is going to be going out this way, which is not that much of a concern, but all this weight going this way towards the house would be a big concern to me if I was in that house. And so, uh, you know, again, for... 300, $350, you know, that, that's a pretty cheap uh, insurance policy that that thing just doesn't come crashing down on top of the house. And uh, and again, if you're up there painting it anyway and you, it takes you an extra half an hour, 15 minutes to put the cable in, you know, you've, you've helped yourself and you've helped your client as well. So that, that's a pretty easy one to sell there. I've got another question here um, from someone on Facebook. Dave Coons is asking, how much tension do you put on the cable when installing? Yeah. The, now, again, going back to the ANSI standards, the Andy, ANSI standards say that the cable should be taut, T-A-U-T, whatever that means. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't need to be slack, but it really, you don't really have to kind of like jack the two pieces of the tree together in any kind of a violent way. It, it really just needs to be taut. It needs to be, uh, there needs to be some tension on it. And, and really, uh, the, the tree is going to continue to grow and it's going to continue to get heavier. So the tree will tighten up a cable itself. So there's no real reason to put a whole lot of tension on it, except, and the, the standards really don't uh, address this, but I, I think it's a legitimate issue. Uh, you can use cabling for uh, tree repair or uh, ancillary tree repair. And, and what I mean by that is Let's just say you have a bifurcated trunk and, and it, it has a split in it, and but the people don't want to lose the tree. They don't want to remove it. They, they want to fix it. Well, uh, you know, you can put cabling, not cabling, but uh, uh, tree rods into where the split is, put two or three rods in it, and that's addressed in the standards as well. But in addition to those rods, uh, you can go up another two thirds of the way up the tree and put in a cable. And the cable has a lot more mechanical advantage than the rods do because the rods are right at the split and you have all that weight over the split that, that the wind's going to wave back and forth and it, you know, it's going to tend to want to pull that split apart. But if you lock it in with the cable two thirds up, uh, then that, that helps that repair. And in that, instance, and again, this isn't addressed in the standards, but in that instance, I put uh, a pretty good bit of pressure on that cable because I I'm not wanting, this is not really a preventative measure as much as it is a repairing kind of a nature. And you're trying to help the repair that you just made, you know, down below in the crops that is split. So uh, you know, sometimes it, it, you can put more pressure on it. And I think it's good to put more pressure on it than taught. Makes sense. Uh, what in, um, uh, when you are doing this, what other is, is this sort of steel cabling the only option that there is out there for cabling a tree? No, it's not. They're, they're basically, you know, uh, I guess two options, the, the static or steel cable, which we've been talking about, but then there's also the, uh, the synthetic or rope type cabling, uh, that, you know, it came out and it was pretty popular for a while. I, I don't know that it's, it might be losing some of its popularity, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the advantage of the synthetic cable 
is that you don't drill any holes in the tree. Uh, it goes around the tree rather than through the tree. Uh, the, 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 the dynamic ca cabling, you mean? The dynamic cable, right? right. Okay. Yeah. And plus, uh, it's it said that it it allows the uh, the the tree to move. It doesn't hold the tree as tight as a static cable does. But it's been my observation that even with a static cable, both pieces can move, you know, pretty much any way they want to, except directly away from each other. In other words, they can kind of go. They can kind of go like this. Or they can, you know, kind of go like this. They just can't go, but so far like this. Now they can go like this. They can go in and out, but it stops them going a certain distance out like this. And so I really don't think that the, uh, you know, that the uh, wood is going to be weakened because the tree can't move. I mean, people have said that that's what happens with with uh, static cabling is that the crotch is weak and cause the, the wood doesn't move. But when I'm seeing it, the wood does move. It moves pretty much everywhere except the one place you don't want it to move, which is too far like this. You just don't want it to go like that. You want it to stop here somewhere. But the dynamic uh, cabling gives the ability for it to move a good bit. Uh, and you know, even more so than the static cable, and because it it does have some give to it, I I think those I think the uh, uh, dynamic cable is not a it's not a static rope; it's a dynamic rope that has stretch to it. Uh, what are so? I your so what are the the disadvantages then of that dynamic rope if it if that's not that big of a selling point of it, are there reasons to not use it? Yeah, well, well, let me count the ways. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I, I'm, I'm very biased, as you well know, but uh, dynamic cabling uh, to me has, you know, a, a, a good number of minuses. One is, is it's extremely expensive. I mean, I, you know, one of my one of my ends might cost depends on who's selling it. You know, twenty five dollars something like that to to do a dynamic cable. You're probably up to hundreds of dollars uh, by the time you get all the pieces that you need to install it. So it's it's just uh, uh, terrifically more expensive than uh, the cabling system that you could do with the, with the wire stops. Or, or one of these other things, you know, the wedge grip even, you, it's still a lot less than it is dynamic cabling. And then you also have, and it's said uh, that one of the big advantages to dynamic cabling is it's green. And what they mean by that is that you don't have to drill a hole in the tree, which is true, except that uh, if you don't, uh, inspect and adjust a dynamic cable every year, it will girdle the tree. And I've seen examples where the, the dynamic cable is eaten into the tree and girdled it, which makes a dangerous situation because anything above that girdling can snap off. And if you put that cable in and you've not inspected it every year and it gets girdled and something snaps off and hits somebody or hits something, then you're into a liability issue. So uh, for me, I, I would, I, especially, I mean, I know people that put in, you know, several hundreds of cables uh, a year and for them to keep track of all these cables and make sure that they're adjusted uh, every year. And if they're not, they're going to be in a liability situation. That would not be something, you know, that I would want to do. So, so then they're very difficult to install. Like I, I think, I don't know how long it would take me to, to put one of those things in, but probably more than an hour, uh, as opposed to, you know, 15 minutes or so for, for a, uh, a wire stop cable. And then, and then the looks of them too. I mean, if you, if you've ever seen one installed, they kind of look like a, uh, 
a big spider's web up in the tree or something. I mean, they're these big black uh, synthetic ropes that can be an inch in diameter and they, they, they're just not very attractive. I mean, they, they, that's just something that you see. And I like much better, you know, not seeing them uh, with a small, smaller steel, steel cable. They basically just kind of disappear in the tree as opposed to being, you know, very visible. So uh, I'm not sure I've hit all the points, but uh, <laughs> but <laughs> they, they, they are not, the, the, I'll just say I have a lot of customers that have used them and weren't satisfied with them and they've gone away from them. Gotcha. Um, and so uh, what going over to the other side, what would you say are the advantages and disadvantages to static cabling? Well, I've already talked about some of the advantages. Uh, I mean, and one of the advantages, especially to, you know, the wire stop is, is the size of hole that you need to install it. Uh, because you're, you don't, uh, drill a hole except one sixteenth of an inch larger than the cable. So if you're using a quarter inch cable, you're talking about a five sixteenths inch hole, which is, you know, uh, a pretty small, uh, I mean, you can see this cable It's one sixteenth mm -hmm. of an inch, you know, larger than that cable. And so in the growing seasons, uh, the cambium roll will seal that up, you know, you know, probably within a month. And so it's not a whole lot of damage. And then we've seen, uh, trees that have been cut down after they've had cables in them for several years. And there can be some streaking that goes up and down from where the cable is, but I, I'd have never seen one that has decayed. And that doesn't mean that it hasn't, because I certainly haven't seen all the cables that have been in trees. I, there's, you know, like I said, thousands of them, but I have seen, I have seen some, and I've never seen one that's decayed yet. So, uh, you know, the, the, the advantage of being able to have that small wound and it's easy for the tree to heal. And then, uh, having the, 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 the looks, I mean, the looks are very important to me. I don't want my tree to look like it has a clothesline in it, or it has, you know, a spider's web in it, or it has whatever else. I don't want to see it. And that's one of the good things about the, uh, 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 static cabling is that it basically disappears up in the tree, unless you know, it's up there. Uh, you can't see it. You won't know it's up there. So, so I like that. And then it's stronger. Again, you can put a three eighths inch EHS cable up in there. That's 18,000 something pounds. The, uh, you know, the, the strongest synthetic cables, not, you know, it's not even close to that. Uh, so, uh, the ease of installation is big, uh, when, when you don't have, uh, especially with, with the wire stop system, you just have two parts to keep up with. Uh, you know, when I, when I go up into a tree to put a cable in, I have a little pouch, uh, that, uh, little leather pouch and I keep, uh, about ever how many cables I'm going to put in there. I put a couple extra wire stops in just in case I drop one, I'll have everything I need when I go up there. And, uh, and it, it you know, I just need two parts for each end and that's it as opposed to you know, all the parts that you need for a, uh, a, a, uh, dynamic cable, which is, I don't know, eight or 10 or something. You have all these fids and I, I don't even know what all of them are. I have a picture of them. If you want to see them, <laughs> yeah. it's like, let me pull the picture up. <laughs> you sell them. So don't talk too dirty about them. I know you sell them, but, but, but you need not to be selling. You need to be selling my stuff. Uh, yeah, th this is a, this is kind of a picture of everything that you need to do the, the, uh, dynamic cabling down here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's a lot of pieces of stuff and, uh, it takes a while to put them in. So, uh, there we go. 
Yeah, that's a good amount of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, um, where would you like to go? And then from... another thing with yeah. the with the synthetic cable is that you have to have uh, you have to have limbs to install it. Like they because it doesn't go through the tree, it has to go around the tree where a limb is. And oftentimes, where I think the ideal place for a cable to be is not where limbs are. And so you're you're kind of limited in where you can put them, uh, and and sometimes the place that you have to put them is not the ideal place. Alrighty. Uh, do you want to keep going, or do you want me to keep feeding you some questions here? Yeah, questions are fine if you have some. Um, I don't. I I have questions that I can I can feed you. Of, um, Unless you want to keep going with some more photos. Yeah, I'm, let me see. I, I think I have one or two more. I'm about finished with the photos. Let me okay. pull one up. We are about an hour of the way through. Okay. I know you were you were uh, kind of nervous about <laughs> about making it uh, the whole time, yeah. but we got a lot more to go still. Okay. Well, let, yeah, let's, let's talk about this one other picture because I do think when, when you, when you get into cabling, I mean, one of the things that, and I, I brought this up just a little bit before, but, but it, it probably needs to be emphasized a little bit more. If you see this tree, uh, let me see where my cursor's at. You can see right in here where there's some included bark. And there's also starting to get some 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 dark weeping coming down from that. And that's a bifurcated tree. You can't see the house. This is the fence right around the house. But this this stem right here would definitely be going right towards the house. And to me, when you get into a situation like that, uh, you know, that's pretty iffy as far as whether I would be willing to put a cable in that or not. I mean, I'd be more going, okay, uh, th this, this is a hazardous tree. You know, this is going to be a problem and you probably need to take it down, not cable it. So, so making that determination, I think is very important for an arborist to do. Uh, because again, you, you don't, you don't want to put somebody's home or their person in danger, uh, you know, to, by cabling a tree that really is not, uh, it's not worthy of being cabled, if you will. It's just not not a good tree. And I, I think this one, if it's not there, it's pretty close to being there. But a, but a good inspection, I think, is, is very necessary to any tree that you're thinking about cabling so that you don't, again, put somebody in an, in an unnecessary situation where they could have damage done uh, from a tree that really is hazardous and needs to be removed, not cabled. What are you uh, inspecting for specifically for that, I guess, uh, when you're going to put a system in a, a tree to determine whether or not it's good enough? Yeah, I'd say, you know, pretty much, uh, pretty much anything that would give you pause as an arborist, as far as the health of the tree goes, uh, like if you were to have, say, fungus uh, conks at the base of the tree, uh, that would certainly uh, give me pause. If in the crown of the tree, you're seeing dead branches up in the crown, not lower branches, which are, you know, it's normal for trees to slough off some of the lower branches that aren't getting enough sunlight, but I'm talking about branches that are getting full sun and, and they're and they're dying out for some reason. To me, that's an indication that you've got some kind of a root problem. Uh, and again, the conks would certainly be an indication that maybe you have a root rot problem. Uh, if you're able to see an obvious girdling root, uh, that could be a problem. Any uh, cavity that looks like and a lot of trees have cavities and i don't know that just because it has a cavity it's something that you know you would have to remove 
but then there's cavities that uh, are substantial enough that I think a tree needs to be removed. And, and uh, so noticing cavities, uh, noticing any, you know, any deformations in the crotches that are substantial, just like this tree looks like it has to me where it has included bark and or weepage from, from the crotch. Uh, you know, that, that would say to me, there's something going on there that's not, not something I'd want to try to repair. I think I'd want to remove that. So, uh, yeah, just inspecting, uh, what, what would be the normal thing that you would inspect on a tree for, for, uh, for problems with it. You know, one other thing that we had mentioned that's in the in the ANSI standards as well, and that is uh, cabling uh, trees to other trees uh, and or cabling trees to the ground. Like both of those uh, are addressed in the in the ANSI standards, and that's something that you can do. Like you've had, if you have a tree and. Uh, you feel like it's fairly healthy, but at the same time, the people would want some assurance, if you will, that it's not going to turn loose and go into their house. You can cable one tree to another tree and, and or you can uh, cable it to an anchor in the ground to, uh, again, give them some assurance that this tree is, is not going it's not, not going to necessarily not fall down, but even if it falls down, it's not going to have a freedom to just to go straight towards the house. It would swing it away from the house. Mm. So that would be another time that, uh, you know, you could use a cable to, to give some assurance to people that they're not going to get hit by this tree. That's interesting. Hadn't seen much about that. Do you have, you have more pictures for us? I don't have any more pictures. I don't think, I think that's pretty much the, everything that I have. Let me look at this one. I think we've seen, no, we hadn't seen this one. Let me show you this one. Yeah, now th this is a multi trunk. You know, you have three different stems coming off this, you know, the same uh, trunk, you know, right at ground level. And this would be a prime candidate for a, uh, what we call a three way uh, we use a we use a hub in the middle, and then we use uh, uh, three cables that attach to that hub in the in the middle. So it's called a hub and spoke system that would tie these three pieces together. And uh, you know, I've actually done a, a red oak one time that was oh, I, I bet it was you know ninety feet high, maybe a hundred feet high. It was a, it was a huge high red oak. And it wasn't split quite this far to the bottom, but it probably wasn't quite as up that it was split. And uh, when I got up to where I was going to put the cable in, uh, I was going to tighten it the way I normally do with a come along and a, and a uh, Haven's grip. But the, the, I could move all three of the trunks easily by hand. I could pull them all together by hand. So I never, I didn't even need to use a winch or anything like that to move them. So uh, when, when uh, you get these multi trunked or stemmed trees, they, they really can move a lot when you get up high. And if all the weight's going towards the house or, you know, to the outside, which is what they typically do, they really can be a liability if they're not stabilized. Um, speaking about that, can we talk a little bit about the different configurations that ANSI talks about and, and when we would use them? Yes. Uh, you know, just a, a normal cable, uh, which is called in the standards, it's called a direct cable. It's just, you know, one, one cable going from you know, one stem or one trunk to another stem or another trunk. So it's just a single cable. And uh, 
uh, you know, you, you go from one side to the other side and, uh, that's all there is to it. And then, and then the, this, uh, I don't know if I can get my cursor over on this or not. Can you see my uh, cursor here? No, that's, that's mine. Okay. Yeah. I'm controlling well, this the, part. The one that's, uh, to the right and to the bottom is called a hub and spoke system, which is what I was talking about uh, mm -hmm. with this three-way trunk. Uh, but this particular hub and spoke system would be a five-way. Uh, and and it's, you know, it's kind of the same. It just has two extra uh, stems to work with. And, uh, you know, we sell uh, hardware that, uh, would accommodate a five-way system and a three-way system and a four-way system as far as that goes. Uh, and then the other type of a system is, is just this, this box system that's on the top right. And uh, that's basically where you, you tie them in rather than from the center, uh, you tie each stem in to the stem next to it. Uh, I, I tend not to be a real big fan of that, but, uh, you know, I, I suppose it works okay. Uh, I've never, again, I've never really done it that way because it, uh, it takes a lot more cabling. Uh, it takes more holes because you have to drill two holes in each stem as opposed to one hole in each stem. And so there's more tree damage and I'm just not sure it gives the same amount of support as a hub and spoke system. So I'm, I'm not a real big fan of it, but that doesn't mean it's not a legitimate way of doing it. The standards, you know, they're in the standards. And so I suppose folks that, you know, know what they're doing, do it and it must, must work for them. But uh, I don't particularly, I don't care for it too much. Mm -hmm. and then the, you know, about the, the same. triangular, I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and that would be about the same with the triangular system too. Yeah. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. pretty similar to the triangular system. It's just three three parts instead of five parts, but it's pretty much the same kind of a system. Um, would you, do you want to go over your video and we can do that and kind of talk yeah, about that, the... That be, yeah, do you, you want to uh, maybe just run it and then I can comment as it's going? Yeah. Uh, you'll have to look up at the live uh, uh, portion here that I've given you uh, to see it. So I right, will go ahead and start this. Uh, they're not hearing any sound either, so you'll have to do okay. all the explanations. Now, what you're seeing right now is the wire stop, which is just those two parts. And then what you see on the left is the preform wrap. And uh, you can see that there's like five parts to it. And the, you know, the preform wrap probably weighs, you know, two pounds and the wire stop weighs about three ounces. And this is just a, a picture of how you do the uh, wire when you're putting a wire stop in. You unwrap it so that it has that star-like pattern. And you want the wire to have that pattern on its own. Like you don't want to force any of the individual wires to take that pattern because if you do that and then you install it and the system loosens, they'll spring back to wherever they were before you kind of moved them. So the best way to do that, to get this pattern is to kind of pop the wire open. And if it doesn't open evenly like this to begin with, uh, make sure that all the wires are kind of separated because sometimes the whiskers will kind of hold uh, different pieces together and it won't allow them to separate. So, but it's best to close it back and open it up again. Like you can do that three or four times. And uh, the more you do it, the more it'll open that pattern. You can even get your ground guys to do it for you if you want to. And that way you don't have to fool with it. But uh, once you get used to it, it's almost kind of automatic. When I do it at trade shows, it's really not fair because it looks like it's so easy. And it can be kind of difficult for people first getting started if they don't know how to do it. But if it, if it doesn't open up properly, then it's good to close it all the way back and open it up again. And this is just showing you what, how to uh, trim off the, the wire. Uh, I trim it off about an eighth of an inch above the taper. And then that middle section is bent over 
And that really is not to hold weight, but rather it's to hold the place. It tells that taper where it has to stay so that when it pulls, the taper goes down in, in between those uh, six other wires and, and then they push up against the block and that's what uh, holds everything together. And I test these with hydraulic cylinders uh, and th this cap is just, it's kind of like a safety cap or it's for looks and uh, it, it doesn't really hold anything, but it, it you know, keeps any sharp edges from, uh, you know, catching your rope or anything like that. And this is just a uh, kind of me demonstrating how to drill through the tree. And this is a 16, I mean, a 5 16 inch auger. And you can see how fast that goes through with just a, standard uh, battery powered drill, but uh, and having it a 16th inch larger than the cable, make sure that your cable goes in, you know, real easily. Uh, you don't have to force it. You actually can uh, use a quarter inch drill uh, to install a quarter inch cable. You know, if you kind of go back and forth several times to do it, but it, it really, you know, it makes it just a little bit sticky to do. And if you have a, if you have a, a little whisker on the cable or if it's, it just makes it a little bit harder, this makes it where it just goes right through and there's no problem. And again, the tree, especially in the growing season can, uh, can close up a 16, six, sixteenth of an inch with the cambium, uh, you know, just really fast. So it's, it's really not a problem to have a sixteenth of an inch over. When I install uh, a cable, and now in this particular thing, this uh, you know the the crotch is real close together. But if, especially if they're further apart, say they're twenty feet apart or forty feet apart, something like that, uh, I go to one side first and I drill the hole and install the wire stop, and then I go to the other side, uh, I drill the hole, and then. Uh, and then put the come along and, and uh, Klein's Haven's grip on it and tension up the system and then put the wire stop on that, that uh, second system. I never go back and forth. Like I, I don't want to be going back and forth between the, between the uh, stems in, in this particular situation that you're looking at. It'd be pretty easy to do that. But, you know, if they're 40 feet apart, like I said, you don't want to be going back and forth. So I, I go to one side and then go to the other side and, and never go back and forth. So right now I'm putting a, a strap just to kind of protect the cambium on the tree. And then we'll put the, the come along on it. And this, this is just a way to get the, the tautness, if you will, that the ANSI standards talk about. You'll see I'm, I don't put a whole lot of pressure on it, but I put enough pressure on it where the wire is not slack. It, you know, it's pretty straight. And another thing to think about is the wires need to be pretty much parallel. Uh, and when I say parallel, I mean kind of straight across. Uh, you don't want the wires kind of, you know, going up and down or sideways. You don't want to side load the system. Although with wire stops, uh, side loading is not nearly as much of an issue as it is with uh, bolts and uh, lags because the bolts and the lags are so much stiffer that they're easier to break with a side load than the cable is. The cable, though it's a stiff cable, it still has enough give that you can have a side load on it and it not be, uh, it not be as bad as it is on an eye bolt or on a, uh, a lag hook. But you still want to get it as straight as you can. I mean, that's, that's the proper way to install it. So that, that, that's the way to do it. And uh, this is just, you know, putting the, putting the wire stop in on the other side of the tree. And I trim, I trim the wires off to about an eighth of an inch past the, uh, uh, past the taper. And then you don't really need any more than that. Uh, and I think I might have already said this. I'm not sure that I have, but I test these uh, wire stops with a hydraulic cylinder and I, I put them on. I have a test bench and I just 
pull them with a hydraulic cylinder until something breaks and the uh, the wire breaks before these ends will come off and uh, so uh, they'll they'll hold you know whatever the wire can hold and again this is just a little safety cap or finishing cap that uh, is not necessary for the system it might look better some folks like them a lot and uh, but it doesn't change anything as far as the functioning of the system goes And that's the installed wire stop. You can see that it's pretty finished looking, pretty professional looking. Not a lot of junk hanging around. Perfect. Pretty easy, pretty simple. It really is easy. Uh, you know, once you once you learn how to do it, I I have a hard time at trade shows actually because it's so easy for me that people that have used them some they go, oh. Well, I, you know, I can't believe it's that easy for you to do that. It, it's not that easy for me. And I go, well, just keep doing it and uh, it will get that easy. I, I almost compare it sometimes to, of course, I don't know, it might not be a good comparison now because hardly anybody knows how to drive a clutch car anymore. But, you know, manual shift transmission, when you first try to learn how, it seems like it's impossible to, you know, to engage the clutch properly. It seems like it just seems like it's such a difficult thing. And of course, once you learn how it's, you don't even think about it. You do it kind of mindlessly. And that's the way that I can do these wires. I, I don't even have to look at them and I can tell you if it opened to the right pattern or not with not even seeing it. I can tell cause almost how it feels. And when you get used to it, that's the way it is. It's really easy to do. Uh, but it's like anything else, you can do it wrong. So you need to learn how to do it properly. Uh, Heather on Facebook, Heather Loberger, um, has the same question that was I was about to ask, which was, if you have uh, any tips for keeping your tools um, handy and all of your, like the, the, the cable, how you get that up there and keep it handy when you're moving 40 feet between uh, tree limbs. Well, let me, let me answer that uh, uh, two different ways. One, and you may or may not be able to see this very well, but let me, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is what I take to cable a tree. It has a little carabiner on it. I just hook it to my, you know, to my saddle. And that's all the tools that I need to cable a tree. Now, I keep, a little pouch that has the wire stops in it and say if I was going to put in one cable this is what I'd take with me it has three wire stops so that if I drop a piece I don't have to go back down and pick it up I have the piece and I can get it later so this is all I take with me when I go to to cable a tree now the the cable itself uh, I usually I usually pull it up with a rope I kind of walk it off on the ground first to see how much I'm going to need and then cut it, you know, at least a foot or two, maybe three or four feet longer. I certainly don't want it to be shorter because, you know, I've just wasted the cable if it's shorter. Mm -hmm. But so I cut it, you know, several feet longer. And then, uh, you know, I just tie the cable on. And a lot of times I'll just bend one of the little strands down just to make sure it doesn't slip off. And uh, I just tie it on the rope and pull it up when I need it. Uh, so I, you know, it's kind of two different things: the cable and the, you know, the cabling equipment, if you will. Um, I've got a question here from someone on Facebook. I'm not quite sure the question. Uh, how far apart do you separate them when you do like a trying? Say that one more time. How far apart do you separate them when you do a triangle? I'm not understanding the question. Uh, yeah, me neither. Um, <laughs> hopefully they'll respond with a little bit of clarification there. Uh, I think, yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, we have a couple other things uh, in the ANSI A300 uh, to talk about, I think. Uh, if you would like to get into those, I don't know. Do you have your, your the questions that you wrote up 
available? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can see one, see one that might be. Oh, here we go. So they're talking about when you're doing a, a, a triangular uh, cabling configuration, how far apart you separate the holes vertically on each limb. Are uh, you talking about the the holes from each other? Yes. Because yeah. there's because there's there's going to be two holes in each stem. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's one of the problems. That's one of the reasons why I don't like doing the triangular system. But uh, I, I'd rather do the hub and spoke system. But I I would I don't know that they have to be real far apart because you're going to be going in different directions with the wood grain. So you definitely wouldn't want to be going in the same direction of the wood grain. Like you wouldn't want two cables or two holes being kind of lined up with each other. Uh, but, but given that they're coming from different directions, I don't think that they would have to be very far apart. I would say, you know, even a couple inches apart would be plenty. Yeah, just, just browsing in, in the, the ANSI. I don't see... It doesn't really talk about that, I don't think. Yeah, if it if it is uh, if if it's addressed, I've not seen it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean it's not in there, but I, I don't I don't recall that being addressed. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Thank you. That was that question. Yeah, there's one thing here about the about uh, a lightning protection that uh, we've not covered. If you know, if you do have a cabling system in a tree, and you have a lightning protection in the tree, uh, they should be joined. You don't want you don't want those two systems to be separate. Because if they're separate, the lightning will jump from one to the other and crack the trunk of the tree. Ah. That makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got something, some stuff here about uh, pruning uh, and cabling and when you want to do those in relation to each other. Yes, and, and that, that's an important thing as well. It, if you're going to be uh, if you're going to be pruning a tree as well as cabling a tree, you definitely want to do the pruning operation first because otherwise, if you put the cable in first and then prune the tree, the tree's going to be lighter and it'll slacken up the cable. So you want uh, you def there, there, there's a definite right order to do that. The pruning is first and the cabling is second. Okay. Pruning is first and cabling is second. And um, <clears throat> uh, so when you're doing these, these configurations, hub and spokes, uh, can you, are you able to double up on an anchor in order to just do one hole instead of doing two holes for like a triangular configuration can you just use one hole and break take uh two cables out from that anchor yeah no the the ANSI standards do specifically address that issue that they, they don't address it uh as far as the triangle they, they don't say anything about that but what it does say is that uh uh, only one cable should be attached to one anchor. That two cables should not ever be attached to one anchor. So okay. that's in any situation, whether it's a triangular situation or anything else. Um, I think that the other thing that we need to talk about here is the A300 and um, 
uh, uh, some of the terminology in the A three hundred, how it's how it's written with like yeah. should and shall and things like that. Yes, the, 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 you know, the A 300 standards use should and shall in very specific ways. Uh, the, the, the shall, when you see that in the standards is a mandatory word. That means that this must happen or this has to be this way. And uh, the, the should, uh, however, is more of a recommended suggestion so it's it's not like it has no no strength to it but it's not a mandatory suggestion or it's not a not something that you have to do but they're recommending that it'd be a good thing to do okay that makes sense the now how long have wire stops been around well technically they've been around for probably 20 years I don't think I've been selling them for more than about 15 years. Okay. And so are they in the ANSI A300? They are. Uh, they're, they're, let me see. There's there's a specific name that they use. Let me see. I can't remember it oftentimes. Uh, cable in terminations. Cable end it's, terminations. Uh, they, they didn't want to put my product in the standards. They mm. said that they would put a specific product in the standards. So I was talking to them about, you know, including the wire stops in the standards. And so they, they, they would not put that specific wording wire stop in the standards, but they, but instead call it uh, wire Cabling uh, wire stop. What is it, Gar? I just said <laughs> cabling in <laughs> cabling in terminations. Yeah. Cabling in terminations, and so that would cover you know uh, preforms uh, uh, wire grab thing as well as as the wire stop and and really any kind of a uh, you could use a swage fitting where, where you swag the, the wire and have a have a uh, uh, something to hold it with and uh, it would it would include anything that was connected more on the outside of the limb or the trunk rather than the inside okay um, I've got another question here from uh, Heather so you mentioned that dynamic uh, um, cabling needs to be inspected every year. Um, static cabling does not need to be inspected every year. Uh, she is asking if you re recommend pruning on a regular maintenance schedule around that cable um, or for, for upkeep, even uh, if it doesn't need inspected itself. Yeah, I mean, you, it's not a bad idea to inspect uh, static cabling every now and then. It's, I think it, it can be done, but, but static cabling really is permanent. I mean, it's meant to stay in the tree and the, you know, the, the tree will actually grow over the wire stop where it'll disappear. You won't even know it's in there until you start cutting it up with a chainsaw and then you'll know it's in there. But, uh, uh, it, it basically disappears and then, but you can see the cable itself, but the wire stops, you can't see. And so, uh, you know, you, you can inspect them and, but you won't be able to see the wire stop itself. You can see the cable. If the cable looks like it's starting to degrade or rust or something like that, you know, you might want to consider, and, and that was that's something that normally happens. You know, maybe it depends on the situation, but but you're you're maybe talking about ten years or maybe fifteen years. I mean, it takes a while for that to happen. But and when that happens, I recommend people don't take the old cable out, but rather go up another say ten or fifteen feet and install a new cable because the tree will have grown pretty significantly in that amount of time. And it doesn't hurt to leave the old cable in. So, so the, the, the static cable 
with the, with the wire stop ends, it's meant to be a permanent installation. And it doesn't mean that you can't inspect it. You I mean, you probably should inspect it just like you should inspect all your trees and look and see how they're doing. And if you see something wrong, you can address it, but, but they're not made to be adjusted. Uh, they, they, there's no adjustment to them. You can't make them longer. Uh, and, and there's really no need again in taking them out, even if they've been weakened, it doesn't hurt that they're in there, but I, I'd recommend putting another cable in higher at that point. Um, I don't have any other questions right now. I think, uh, you pretty much covered everything that the, uh, you said you wanted to cover on here. Do you have any, any closing thoughts or anything you want to hit on again? Uh, you know, not, not really. I think I've covered pretty much everything that, uh, you know, that, that I wanted to cover and, uh, but I, I do want to thank you and, uh, uh, for allowing me to be a part of this and thank the people that are listening for their time, because I know they have other things they could do with their time and their time's valuable to them. So I, I appreciate, you know, you folks out there that are listening and paying attention to what's going on. And, and if you do, uh, you know, have questions later on, please get in touch with Kale or get in touch with me, either one. And I'd be more than happy to uh, try to answer your questions. And if I can't, can't answer them, I'll try to find somebody that can. But uh, I, I just want to thank everybody that, that is uh, listening. And thank you again, Kale, for giving me the time to, to talk. Of course. Yeah. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, as part of... Um of what you were talking about with uh, get in contact with us. Uh, if you have any questions, anything that you need, uh, you can always contact media at treestuff.com and we will get you uh, the help that you need or uh, um, uh, info at treestuff.com will get you to a customer service. But if you want to get to myself or Nick Bonner quickly, uh, you can always send out media at treestuff.com. Uh, uh, we also have rope at tree stuff, PHC at tree stuff that takes you directly to experts in those fields. We don't have a cabling for uh, at treestuff.com yet, uh, but maybe I will uh, talk with Stephen and that might get set up pretty soon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for your time and uh, sharing all your wisdom here. Uh, great having you. If you are still here with us, which looks like a lot of you are, I have posted the CEU quiz in the comments section. Uh, once again, if you take that and get 16 out of 20 correct, then you will earn two CEUs as long as you're watching this live or within the, about the next 24 hours. So thank you very much for joining us and have a nice night, everyone. Good night.